Merci pour votre patience. Donc, mon nom est Cassandra Mafouta et je suis la chargée de projet euh, du projet pilote de justice audistique, qui est un programme de justice réparatrice par et pour les communautés noires. Euh, pour m'introduire un peu, euh, j'ai étudié en fait à l'Université d'Ottawa en droit. Euh, j'ai pratiqué un an et demi en droit criminel. Euh, j'ai laissé la pratique pour aller vers le secteur public, euh, une sorte de l'immigration et de la diversité, et à la commission de libération conditionnelle où j'ai travaillé dans tout ce qui est euh, pardon et clémence, pour ensuite me retrouver à Outstock depuis euh, cette année. Donc, je reprends un projet euh, qui a été initié par euh, cet organisme-là. Donc, pour commencer, je vais faire un, un, un petit table des matières euh, de la présentation. En fait, on va plus parler des démarches qui ont été effectuées pour arriver à un projet de justice réparatrice par et pour les communautés noires, pour ensuite expliquer le projet en tant que tel, l'évaluation aussi de la collecte de données et les enjeux actuels qui ont été dénotés en fait jusqu'à présent. Pour vous donner le contexte, donc la justice réparatrice, c'est un modèle de justice dans lequel les parties impliquées échangent et euh, veulent régler euh, les conflits. Donc, le but, c'est de réparer les torts causés. Dans cette optique-là, il y a plusieurs programmes de déjudiciarisation euh, qu'on appelle les programmes de sanctions extrajudiciaires pour les mineurs de 12 à 17 ans. Donc, c'est des programmes qu'on retrouve au Québec. Euh, au Québec, 75 des personnes adolescentes profitent de sanctions extrajudiciaires. Et euh, ces programmes-là permettent aux jeunes de ne pas avoir de dossier euh, d'adolescents, donc de passer vers des programmes alternatifs et de voir leur accusation rejetée, ce qui euh, leur fait, fait qu'ils ne sont pas judiciarisés. Pour les adultes, en 1996, il y a eu un changement dans le code criminel euh, qui a fait en sorte qu'on on a laissé le pro, le, les provinces instaurer des programmes de mesures de rechange général qui sont similaires aux programmes euh, pour les jeunes contrevenants et qui permettent aux adultes de 18 ans et plus de passer vers un programme alternatif et de voir leur accusation rejetée également. Par contre, au Québec, euh, cette implantation-là est venue très tard. Euh, en 2001, il y a le programme de mesures de rechange pour les Autochtones, qu'on appelle PMRA, euh, qui est vraiment conçu pour les adultes de 18 ans et plus qui se, qui se considèrent comme Autochtones. C'est seulement en 2017 qu'au Québec, un programme pour adultes euh, qu'on appelle le PMRG, le programme de mesures de rechange général euh, a été implanté pour tous les contrevenants euh, adultes non autochtones. Puis si on regarde les statistiques, on les connaît un peu déjà. Euh, au niveau de la population carcérale noire, euh, au fédéral en fait, malgré le fait qu'on représente 3,5 des personnes noires au Canada, euh, on est surjudiciarisé avec 7,3 des détenus qui sont dans, des, euh, dans le système carcéral fédéral. Et si on regarde à Montréal, euh, je vais parler de Montréal parce qu'en fait, Outstock et euh, le projet s'implantent à Montréal. Euh, les personnes noires représentent 9,5 de la population, mais compte pour 27 des personnes interpellées, 13 des personnes qui reçoivent des fonctions d'infraction et 20 des personnes qui sont accusées. Donc, c'est vraiment, euh, on voit que c'est encore une fois disproportionné. Et le profilage racial a été considéré comme étant euh, un enjeu qui, qui fait en sorte qu'il y a une surreprésentation de de, des personnes noires dans le système de justice. Je vais aller brièvement avec Rootstock, pour ceux qui ne le connaissent pas. Euh, C'est vraiment un organisme qui est implanté à Montréal-Nord euh, depuis 2009. Euh, pour ceux qui ne connaissent, connaissent pas trop l'historique, euh, il y a eu en 2009 la mort d'un jeune euh, à Montréal-Nord qui s'appelle Freddy Alberto Villanueva, euh, qui a été abattu par le SPVM. Et ça a fait en sorte qu'il y a eu un, sou, un soulèvement euh, de résidents euh, qui ont commencé à dénoncer, à faire des revendications, euh, dont une a porté euh, contre les pratiques abusives de la police. Donc, Outstock a été créé à partir de là, ce qui fait que depuis ce, ce, cet, cet événement-là, euh, Outstock essaie de créer des politiques, ou en fait des politiques, des projets, des initiatives, des activités, des ateliers pour euh, réduire les enjeux systémiques que vivent les personnes euh, racisées et immigrantes euh, à Montréal-Nord, dont les personnes noires, parce qu'à Montréal-Nord, pour ceux qui ne le savent pas, euh, c'est un, un quartier dans l'est euh, du Québec 
euh, où il y a beaucoup de personnes immigrantes, euh, par exemple, 42, personnes, 42 des personnes immigrantes et euh, 49 de ces résidents-là se considèrent comme une minorité visible. Et de cette minorité visible-là, 53 s'identifient comme étant noirs. Et euh, dans les personnes immigrantes, Haïti revient comme le pays qui, euh, où euh, les personnes immigrantes servent leurs origines, ce qui fait qu'il y a une population noire qui est très présente dans le quartier. Et c'est dans cette optique-là qu'en 2020, Outstock a rejoint Iki Justice, je vais en parler plus tard, mais c'est une asso association provinciale qui vise à regrouper tous les organismes euh, qui œuvrent à, euh, à émettre la justice réparatrice et la médiation citoyenne. Et euh, actuellement, Outstock euh, prend en charge tous les dossiers euh, de l'Est de Montréal. Donc, on parle de Montréal-Nord et euh, des autres quartiers comme Anjou, Saint-Léonard. Ceux qui ne connaissent pas trop Montréal, c'est les arrondissements qui se trouvent euh, dans l'est de la ville. Et pour parler de justice audistique, c'est, comme je l'ai dit, un projet pilote de justice réparatrice pour les personnes afrodescendantes âgées entre 18 et 64 ans euh, qui se veut être intégrée dans les programmes qui sont déjà en place. Donc, pour les adultes, comme je l'ai expliqué, on parle du programme de mesures de rechange général, PMRG, euh, qui vise la dégénération des personnes euh, adultes qui sont accusées. Euh, donc, la personne qui réussit la justice audistique voit également ses accusations rejetées au lieu de passer devant un juge euh, de plaider coupable non coupable. Donc, euh, c'est dans cette optique-là, dans le but de déjudiciariser euh, les personnes noires. Donc, la particularité de notre, de notre projet, on va en parler un peu plus tard, mais c'est vraiment une approche multidisciplinaire, holistique et intersectionnelle où on ne veut pas simplement parler euh, des, euh, des, des torts causés. C'est vraiment important mais il faut aussi voir la reconstruction de la personne accusée euh, dans l'optique un peu de, de guérison aussi. Donc, ce n'est pas juste voir la criminalité sur l'angle de la personne accusée et la victime, mais c'est aussi, aussi la reconstruction de soi qui est au cœur du projet. Si on regarde les bénéficiaires du projet, on parle des personnes qui s'identifient comme étant noires. Euh, pour la première année, euh, on a voulu que ça soit simplement pour les hommes, étant donné que la criminalité chez les femmes est différente. Et euh, pour la première année aussi, le lieu de résidence, c'est toutes les personnes qui habitent dans l'Est de Montréal, dans le but d'offrir le projet euh, dans le Grand Montréal par la suite. On parle de personnes âgées entre 18 et 64 ans euh, qui ont commis des infractions dans le cadre du PMRG. Donc, comme je l'ai dit, euh, pour le programme de mesures de rechange général, c'est des infractions qui sont vraiment spécifiques. Donc, ce n'est pas toutes les infractions qui rentrent dans le programme, c'est des infractions qu'on considère comme « soft crime ». Euh, bon, crime moins sérieux. Euh, et euh, la personne ne doit pas admettre le crime, mais les faits qui sont liés à l'infraction qui a été commise et doit vouloir participer aussi. Donc, le but, c'est que la personne euh, puisse participer de façon volontaire et que ça ne soit pas imposé à elle. Si on regarde les démarches qui, qui ont été effectuées jusqu'à présent, donc, comme je l'ai dit, Outstock euh, fait beaucoup de forums sociaux pour parler des enjeux systémiques que vivent euh, les personnes. Euh, à Montréal-Nord, notamment. Et en 2016, le Forum social a porté, a porté euh, sur le racisme systémique. Et c'est de là qu'un projet de justice alternative a été présenté comme étant une solution pour réduire euh, certains enjeux euh, systémiques que vivent les personnes noires en lien avec leur surreprésentation et aussi le fait qu'il n'y a pas beaucoup de programmes qui sont adaptés à leurs besoins et leurs réalités. En 2017, il y a eu un, un, un groupe d'experts euh, qui se sont regroupés, qui ont recensé euh, les meilleures pratiques pour instaurer un, genre, un, un, pro, un projet de justice réparatrice. Et euh, au Forum social de 2017, ce projet-là avait été présenté. En 2019, euh, Outstock a fait appel au service aux collectivités de l'UQAM pour encadrer le projet, pour avoir, si on veut, euh, du poids académique euh, sur les démarches qui ont, qui ont été effectuées parce qu'on se rend compte que c'est euh, assez important pour euh, avoir l'approbation de, de plusieurs gouvernements, d'avoir euh, un certain encadrement euh, d'un projet. Et il y a eu des, des, un dépliant en septembre 2019 qui a été euh, constitué pour recenser tous les programmes euh, de justice alternative qui offrent un programme qui est similaire, donc au Canada. Et c'est en, en 2019 que euh, il y a eu une conférence, en fait, durant le forum social où on a présenté euh, un projet de justice alternative 
euh, où les personnes participantes devaient dire qu'est-ce qu'ils voudraient faire, comment la situation devrait être réglée. Donc, c'était un cas qui revient, qui revient, qui revient souvent euh, dans, euh, dans, dans, dans ce qu'on voit dans, le, dans la vie de tous les jours. Et les gens devaient se pencher sur cette question-là. Oh mon Dieu, cinq minutes. OK. Je vais passer rapidement, mais bref, euh, suite à plusieurs groupes de discussion, il y a eu des, des groupes de discussion euh, qu'on qui, qu qu a voulu implanter, mais qui a été mis en suspens à cause de la pandémie. Et il y a eu des recherches effectuées aussi avec l'UCAM pour recenser les besoins des personnes noires dans un, dans un programme de justice alternative. Je vais aller rapidement pour la mission. Comme je l'ai expliqué, c'est de trouver l'écho sous-jacente de la criminalité chez les personnes noires, réduire la sous-représentation des personnes noires dans le système de justice et offrir un espace de réflexion pour que la personne accusée, la victime, puisse échanger et avoir aussi euh, de, la, de les appuis dans leur processus de guérison. Donc, il y a d'autres en, euh, enjeux qui sont importants, mais ça, c'est les, les enjeux que, qui sont prin, principaux. Euh, pour aller rapidement dans le processus décisionnel, euh, pour qu'une personne soit référée, elle doit passer par le procureur de la Couronne. Donc, c'est lui qui a la discrétion pour référer un dossier au PMRG. Et ensuite, c'est Equijustice, dont l'organisme que je vous parlais, qui réfère le dossier à un organisme qui se trouve euh, dans l'Est de Montréal, tout dépendamment de où la personne réside. Dans le cas de la justice audistique, la personne est référée euh, à Rootstock et elle décide de choisir le PMRG, qui est le programme qui est déjà en place, ou euh, d'aller vers notre, dans, dans notre projet qui est justice audistique. Pour aller rapidement, euh, dans le processus pour la personne accusée, euh, on a euh, des, des rencontres avec plusieurs personnes dans le personnel qui comprend l'intervenant sur judiciaire et un professionnel en santé mentale. Euh, il y a aussi des, des retraites qu'on offre de guérison qu'on appelle où on offre des ateliers afrocentriques pour que la personne justement puisse avoir un espace pour se reconstruire. Et la particularité du projet, c'est que la mesure euh, pour réparer le tort causé c'est euh, déterminé par la personne participante, mais également son cercle social, dans le but d'inclure en fait euh, la famille ou les personnes qui sont aussi affectées par le fait que la, que la personne a une accusation criminelle. Au niveau de la victime, c'est le même processus, sauf qu'il n'y a pas de retraite. Et lorsque la, ça, la, la, la victime décide de s'impliquer ou non, donc quand elle décide de s'impliquer, il y a une rencontre par la suite pour déterminer quelle serait la mesure qui serait applicable dans la situation. Dans les ateliers qu'on offre dans les retraites, l'atelier de Kassala, qui est un concept afrocentrique où on veut célébrer l'être humain à travers la poésie, l'art, et l'atelier culturel aussi, où on essaie de déterminer le vécu de la personne, donc euh, sa lignée, euh, ses sentiments d'appartenance, son expérience migratoire aussi, pour créer un, un genre d'histoire noire noir collective. Il y a aussi atelier sur l'activité physique, atelier sur l'histoire des Noirs, où on veut euh, aller mettre de côté ce qui est promené dans les écoles, euh, où on commence l'histoire des Noirs avec l'esclavage et le colonialisme, mais parler de la vie euh, des personnes Noires avant que l'esclavage et le colonialisme euh, arrivent, et également l'apport des personnes Noires au Canada. Et il y a évidemment aussi l'atelier sur l'estime de soi, où on veut donner des outils à la personne à savoir quelles sont ses aspirations futures et quels enjeux qu'elle voit euh, qu'elle qu qu pourrait rencontrer, comment on peut l'aider à dépasser ces enjeux-là. J'ai parlé du cercle auditique comme étant euh, le, la, la particularité du, pro, du projet où c'est la personne avec son cercle social qui détermine la mesure appropriée. Mais évidemment, dans les cas où la personne n'a pas ce cercle social-là ou ne veut pas que, euh, que ce cercle-là soit, soit impliqué, c'est le personnel du projet avec un organisme communautaire qui œuvre auprès des communautés noires, qui va l'appuyer dans sa décision. Le goût encore, c'est qu'il y ait une participation active des communautés et qu'en même temps, la personne puisse euh, avoir une référence après le projet des organismes qui se trouvent au sein de, sa, de ces communautés. Dans les mesures applicables, ce sont les mêmes qu'on retrouve dans le PMRG. Les seules différences, c'est qu'on a rajouté des suivis psychosociaux familiaux et également un programme de mentorat. Lors des démarches, euh, il a été dit que les jeunes ou les personnes participantes ont besoin euh, d'avoir un, un mentorat, un mentorat, une personne noire qui évolue dans le domaine qui euh, la passionne. Et dans le fond, le mentorat a été suggéré comme étant un, un outil qui pourrait aider les personnes à être motivées et euh, se focaliser sur autre, autre chose. Euh, je vais passer rapidement pour euh, l'évaluation. 
mais on a un questionnaire sociodémographique où on veut comprendre le profil des personnes qui utilisent le projet, euh, qui utilisent le projet et les programmes de digitalisation aussi, et un outil pour évaluer leurs objectifs primaires et secondaires. Euh, il y a aussi des entrevues qui sont données pour voir leur impression sur le, 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 le projet, euh, les retraites, ce qui devrait être amélioré ou non. Les enjeux, ça c'est la partie qui est quand même assez importante. Euh, le projet a commencé depuis le 15 août et dans le fond, qu'est-ce qu'on remarque, c'est qu'il y a un problème au milieu du référencement. Au départ, le projet était euh, ouvert pour les 18 à 35 ans. Euh, on a élargi ça à 18 à 64 ans. Euh, puis c'est pour garder le processus, euh, on voit en fait que, ça c'est des hypothèses, hein, je ne veux pas dire que c'est la réalité, on vient de commencer le projet, mais euh, on émet plusieurs hypothèses, à savoir, est-ce qu'il y a un problème lié à la discrétion du procureur euh, à référer les dossiers euh, d'une personne noire vers un programme qui est pour la digitaliser? Euh, aussi les critères des infractions admissibles, est-ce que ce sont des infractions qui rejoignent, je ne vais pas dire rejoignent les, les crimes commis par les personnes noires, là, mais est-ce que ça répond à une certaine tendance qu'on voit au niveau de la criminalité chez les personnes noires? Et est-ce qu'il y a une connaissance du programme au niveau des différents acteurs et, et aussi des avocats et même ben, des, des gens de la société? Et il y a un gros problème lié à la race aussi. Il n'y a pas de données, en fait, liées à la race. Euh, tant dans le programme de PMRG, il y a beaucoup d'études euh, qui ont, ben, certaines études qui ont été faites qui parlent euh, du profit des personnes qui utilisent les programmes de digitalisation, mais les données liées à la race sont mises de côté. Donc, on ne sait pas l'impact de des programmes de digitalisation sur les personnes qui sont surjudiciarisées. Et c'est la même chose aussi pour les 12 à 17 ans. Je conclue. Euh... <rire> Dans le fond, euh... La justice réparatrice a été conçue par et pour les communautés noires. Ça a été perçu comme un outil pour réduire la surreprésentation des personnes noires dans le système de justice. Euh, mais là, qu'est-ce qu'on voit, c'est que, encore une fois, c'est des hypothèses, ce n'est pas une conclusion que l'on fait, mais euh, on voit qu'il y a un problème qui est systémique ou qui pourrait être systémique au niveau du référencement, à savoir, est-ce que on, les personnes qui sont surreprésentées dans le système de justice sont, sont sous-représentées dans les, dans les systèmes de digitalisation. Donc, euh, voilà ce qui conclut le tout. Uh, hey, everybody. Uh, my name is MJ Rigema. Um, I'm not doing a PowerPoint, so I'm just actually going to read off of my notes here. I'm presenting on behalf of myself and Dr. Regine King over there. Um, and uh, so in that capacity, I'm an adjunct at University of Calgary, Faculty of Social Work, but I'm also an assistant professor at the University of Concordia, of Concordia University in Applied Human Sciences. So the presentation today, we're gonna be talking a little bit about some results from Regine's for Regine, a project led by Regine um, that looked that you saw a little bit of in the earlier session. Um, we're looking at one of the clusters that came out of that research, which was engaging community members in Calgary and Edmonton, about 174 of them, some of them community leaders, some of them informal support people, some of them service providers, to ask them what were actions that could be taken to address Black mental health and create equity for Black people in terms of mental health, mental health equity. And criminalization, as she pointed out earlier, was one of the major things that people talked about. So I'm going to try to, oh yeah, let me, I didn't even put my timer on. I'm going to try to keep it to 15 minutes. And okay, great. And so what I'm going to do is answer three questions or talk about three questions. The first of which is, what is meant by criminalization of Black Canadians and what's the interconnection between criminalization, racial trauma, and Black community mental health? Two, what did we learn from this research study in terms of what, what criminalization does in terms of impacting Black community mental health and what community members wanted done about that? And then the third, if we get to it, depending on the time, it, oh, that got louder, okay. The third, depending on the time, will be what are the implications for policy research and practice. So to start on this question of what is meant by criminalization of Black Canadians, I want to start with an anecdote. Um, many, many years ago as a youth worker in a community called Regent Park in Toronto, 
predominantly black community, racialized community, immigrant community, working class community. And I remember sitting at a round table that involved the police and that involved community organizations. And the police were asking us, you know, how do you get the community to start essentially like co cooperating with us when we do our investigations? <laughs> You're right, exactly. That was our reaction as community members and organizers. And I said to them, you know, well, like, why would people want to cooperate with you when you're criminalizing their kids, right? Like our kids, right? And the cop turned to me and he's like, what do you mean criminalizing? They're criminals. <laughs> no, no, he explicitly said that, right? Yeah, no, and he, he said, and, you know, earlier he'd been having other kinds of discourses about the people that they essentially monitor and chase. So he said this, he said, they're criminals. And that moment for me illustrated uh, quite clearly the unintelligibility, the illegibility, the incommensurability <laughs> between my worldview, <laughs> my worldview, those of us in the social service sector and academia activists who uh, understand racism and anti-Black racism as structuring logics of the society that we live in, and this police officer who did not see himself as implicated in operating from that structuring logic, right? Um, so if he saw, if he even saw them as kids, like we saw them as kids. He, if he even saw them as kids, he also saw them as criminals. So what is meant by criminalization? Uh, there's two thinkers that I want to turn to to think through what that means. The first is Sadia Hartman. The second is Robin Maynard. Um, Sadia Hartman is a, she's a humanities scholar at Columbia. And she wrote quite an uh, important book, Scenes of Subjection, that essentially coined this term, the afterlife of slavery, right? So she just recently wrote an essay about revisiting that for her first major book. And I'm just gonna read the first line from the first paragraph from this essay in which she says, the conviction that I was living in a world created by slavery propelled the writing of Scenes of Subjection, which is the book. I could feel the force and disfigurement of slavery in the present. The life of the captive and the commodity certainly wasn't my past, but rather the threshold of my entry into the world. Its grasp and claim couldn't be cordoned off as what happened then. For me, the relation between slavery and the present was open, unfinished. So she's famous for this concept of afterlife of slavery and the idea that I, I understand that idea as the idea that we're still in the past. We have not been freed from the past. We are still living in the afterlife of slavery as um, black, black people who were brought to these shores as enslaved people and colonialism as black people who've been colonized all over the world, right? So, um, this helps me understand the criminalization of Black people, um, because indeed, once slavery and colonialism were abolished or they were resisted, uh, the legal construction... Thank you. Thank you for coming back. It wasn't a good way to end this wonderful day we've had. So I'm so glad that you're here. So before we get back to the, that beautiful story way you were just narrating this presentation and we had to leave, um, I just want to remind everyone at the end of the uh, presentation, just remember to return your translation equipment if you still have it. They're missing quite a few. And so please just drop it, even if it means here, we'll take them to them. We'll remember to do that. But let's go right back to it then. I don't remember when, where we stop. So how many minutes I'm going to give you now? Uh, <laughs> I'll do so, my best. Yes, so Dr. MJ Wejima, please uh, welcome uh, to the event again and continue your presentation. Okay, is the mic still working? Yes. Great. Okay, so I think I left off at Sadia Hartman and the concept of the afterlife of slavery and the idea that this helps us understand criminalization because the moment there was something like liberation from enslavement or colonialism, uh, the law stepped in to criminalize Black people as a means of essentially re-enslaving and recolonizing, re right? So as the stats go, there's more Black people, for instance, in the United States prisons now than were ever enslaved. Um, there was a whole slew of laws like around idling, being in public spaces that were used to criminalize or enslave Black people in the States. When I teach my students about the RCMP, the Canadian police, um, I ask them, you know, do you know what was the purpose, like when was this founded? And in fact, it was founded to quell indigenous rebellion. So that is the role of the police here in the United States. The role of the police was to catch fugitive black people. 
who, who ran from slavery. And what I'm actually wanting to think about today is that that hasn't changed. That role, that fundamental purpose of police has not changed. Now going to the second theorist, Policing Black Lives, the book by Robin Maynard, professor, she's not a professor yet, but she'll be in a minute, but at, at U of T. Uh, she lays out the ways in which the Canadian state, but not just the Canadian state, all of its um, capillaries are, have been continuously engaged in policing black lives. So not just the police, but um, child welfare, immigration, teachers, shopkeepers, and everyday Canadian citizens who see it as their purpose to oversee, watch, monitor, control, dominate, harass, and ultimately put in contained place, put in their place, Black people. Um, so, you know, when I say this, when I started writing this, I was thinking immediately just images of Black people and what, what has been done to them in recent years came to mind. And the first one was of a Black woman in a Calgary holding station, a police station, 2017. She'd been pulled over because police pull over black people in their cars for no reason. And, you know, she'd been accused of violating a curfew. I don't even remember what the minor reason for that curfew was, but probably being um, monitored in another aspect of her life. But the video shows the police officer wanting to remove her, her headscarf that she was wearing because I believe she was Rastafari. She dodged it. He grabs her and slams her to the ground head first. And I looked up the story because I was remembering like there's example number one, she's policed. I think she might've ended up on curfew because of domestic something or child, like something related to something that wasn't the police, right? Then he stops her because police are in the habit of stopping people. Then he brings her, assaults her. And when I was looking up her name, her name is Dahlia Caffey. I realized, which I didn't know until today that she died last year she died a couple of days before the police officer was sentenced right a few days before he was sentenced to a conditional sentence of a month that amounted to nothing and but she died of an overdose i presume because of how distressed she was at the injustice she was likely going to experience again she wasn't even 30 she worked in a meat plant in red deer she was a mother she's dead and he's been reinstated in an administrative role in the police right so there's myriad stories and myriad names of Black people in Canada who have been killed by the police, either directly, as in many, many cases, or this was an indirect case of police killing, right? It took a few years, and the state participated in it further. But there's Bonnie Jean-Pierre in Montréal, who was killed for having cannabis, which is obviously legal now. We've got Abdi Rahman Abdi here in Ottawa, who was killed because he was having a mental health crisis in a public setting. Andrew Loku, a survivor of war, who was killed in a supportive housing building, a building that was for people with mental health issues. Police were called, they killed him within three seconds of seeing him, right? They'd already encountered him the same day, so they already knew who they were dealing with. Uh, there's Regis Korczynski Paquet in, in uh, Toronto, all these in the last three, four, five years, right? Who the police came, somebody called because she was having a mental health crisis, next thing you know, she's falling off her balcony. Uh, a few months before that, there was a young man, 22-year-old Caleb Njoko, London, Ontario, same thing, having a mental health crisis in his own home. Police came, he falls off his balcony. Uh, there's Lahore Tuel, who's a Sudanese survivor of war who was killed in Calgary. Same situation as Andrew Loco. There's literally three Sudanese people who are having, and you know they, they're survivors of war, for having mental health crisis in public spaces. Police are called on them, and they get killed by the police, right? Uh, and then DeFonte Miller, just a boy strolling through a neighborhood and an off-duty police decides it's a good idea to blind him in the eye. And, and the one thing to think about is that the law, because it doesn't actually recognize race because it's colorblind, ne can never adjudicate for it, right? So the other thing I thought of is the Neptune Four, when we're talking about interventions in addressing criminalization, uh, who are four young teens living in a Toronto housing project, Northern Lawrence, somewhere around there. And they had just come back from a workshop where they were being trained about their rights, their legal rights. And they were told by the lovely workshop facilitator that if the police stops you and they don't have cause, you can ask them, do you have cause? And if they say no, then you say, well, you have to let me go or you can ask, call my parents. So they were walking through the neighborhood, something that happens to them very commonly. Police stop them, start asking them questions. They applied the workshop and said, do you have cause? And the, they said, the police said, what? <laughs> Excuse me? And one of them proceeded to punch one of the kids in the head, right? Four years later, five years later, I know the lawyer who was involved in defending these kids, but a few years later, one of those young boys also died, right? So he had he ended up getting involved in quote unquote criminal, criminalized activity 
but to me it was like a foregone conclusion once you've been criminalized what's gonna and there's no consequence what's the, what's gonna stop you from doing this? so like dali kafi he died a few years after the people who assaulted him the police did not get any consequences right it reminds me when i read these stories of people who die after injustice of Khalif Browder, who's a young man in the United States who was arrested in New York. Oh yeah, I'll, I might not get to section two and three, but he was arrested for, you know, he was accused of stealing a backpack, ended up on Rikers Island for three years pre-trial because they couldn't afford uh, bail for him. <laughs> and he never, and they said, just admit that you're guilty and you'll get off with, you know, a minor community service or something, but he, he refused to admit he was guilty. I guess he wasn't guilty. So he was beaten up, traumatized deeply in this prison. And when he got out, he became a close celeb. Jay-Z, all these people, you know, talking about him. And, uh, and then he killed himself after all the fame came to him. And, but that's not the part that actually like makes me cry when I think about it. And when I presented it to students in my class, it's a year to the day of his death, his mother died of a heart attack, right? Erica Garner, Eric Garner's daughter, same thing. A couple years, a few years. So when black people are <laughs> terrorized by the police, it doesn't just impact the one per the individual, right? It's their community, it's their family. I'm gonna try to speed up through the rest of it. I don't know that I'll get through it um, in five minutes, but I mean, I have more examples that are much closer to home. So my friends, my family, I don't know any black man who hasn't been stopped by the police, older or younger for having a nice car for being, right? But I mean, the things that really hurt me are the kids in my lives, particularly the ones that live in carceral spaces like Toronto community housing, where they're constantly monitored. And from the time that they're very young, made to understand that we view you as criminals and we're going to treat you as criminals. But we're also going to have impunity when we do that. And, you know, a good friend of mine and her, her sons face this regularly and she stands up for them. But this, even the toll of standing up for them also <laughs> is a cost, right? So ultimately what I'm trying to say is that, you know, drawing from critical race theory, that we have to understand the law as a key force in maintaining white supremacy and anti-Black racism, right? Because it still conceptualizes and engages with Black people using uh, Sadia Hartman's terminology as captives, right? Captives meaning people who only belong in certain spaces where you want them to work at the meat factory, you know, where you want them to work in the service industry. <laughs> Uh, in the community housing buildings that you've deemed they can access and live in, but you are monitoring them with ca cameras. If you are a refugee without status in detention centers without having convicted you of a single crime for seven plus and ongoing years. Um, and uh, and even for those of us who are, you know, middle class and aren't in some of these contained spaces, if you go to a, a public festival like Afrofest, you're still going to have multiple noise complaints called by your neighbors because black people having joy in public space isn't seen as acceptable because we are still viewed as captives, right? So Maynard offers us this framework that this policing isn't just limited to what the police do, but what the state does. And so she looks at things like being pushed out of the school system, um, being, being uh, trapped in immigration jail, being discriminated against from having housing, jobs, et cetera, et cetera. But I'll add to it something that Regine was talking about in her presentation is also carceral mental health and psychiatry. So being a overrepresented in um, diagnoses of schizophrenia, she was saying, uh, black children being overly psychiatrized. And, and then when they are in psychiatric institutions, the, there was a stat that she shared as well, which was restrained at CAMH, largest mental health hospital, 44, 44 percent higher, the restraints for Black people is 44 percent higher than white people. So the question then is, what do Black community members think about this? And uh, that's where I'm going to turn to Regine's project, but I like, I don't know. I know I'm sure I'm past the time at this point. One minute. One minute? Okay, I'll try to do what I can. So it was a concept matching pro pro project, <laughs> concept mapping project. As you saw, they, they asked people to think about um, what are some actions that can be taken to support Black mental health equity? And then there was, you know, uh, looking at uh, what do they rate as important and what's actually being implemented in action. And they rated 
um, addressing the criminalization of Black people and having culturally appropriate mental health services as like the top two, and then the lowest in terms of being implemented in action, right? And they said, you know, in that they were saying these are some of the things that they want would want is, you know, exchange and open communication between police and community, but that being something that wouldn't work without Statement 62, which was established policies and practices of holding accountable systems that perpetuate racism, including the police, right? So I know Quebec recently said, rule the judge ruled that you can't just stop Black people anymore. And I watched the police union head quickly say, well, if we can't do that, unfairly stop people, then we can't do our jobs. And he was being, he was being serious, right? <laughs> he's like, he's like, but that is how you're taking away our tools, right? And I was like, you're being honest. Uh, these these uh, community participants also say stop racial profiling Black Canadians by, uh, by law enforcement, address un unfairness towards Black youth in the justice system. And, and they also shared that they view that the policies that are actually those policies that are in place to ensure the safety and protection of Canadians are instead used to criminalize Black people. Um, so that the law is actually being used to criminalize, right? And the final last thing that they requested is having a legal aid as a support for racial injustices, right? So conclude, yeah, let me conclude, let me conclude. What are the implications for policy practice research? I'm gonna conclude with uh, just a story, a quick story. Okay. Um, when I was <laughs> social worker in a community mental health organization, Jane and Finch, I had a uh, older Jamaican woman come for counseling because her son with a disability was beat up by the police because he didn't understand what they were saying. He had an intellectual disability. He didn't understand what they were saying. They beat him up and she had to come to counseling for that, right? But in all of that, her pain was that there's no consequence for the police, right? There's no zero. Like her son is traumatized. She's traumatized. The whole community that watched him go down is traumatized. And the police have done this with complete impunity. So for me, and you know, there's many, many, those kids who went to the workshop, um, there's a nine-year-old boy who was, you know, his, his teacher told him he's a criminal because he has a do-rag. The mom comes to protest. She calls security on the mom. So all of this. So for me, in terms of addressing these issues, I think that we need to kind of go with Maynard and Hartman and realize that there's an ongoing, ongoing process of terror being meted out, not just on individuals, but communities. And that the, it's the helplessness in the face of the impunity and the societal gaslighting and denial that the Canadian society is doing to Black communities, that is part of the ongoing trauma. So think about the abuse dynamic in, you know, a, a man who beats his wife or his kids. He beats them. He denies that he's doing it. He's gaslighting them. And they're helpless. Like the trauma is in the helplessness. That's what liberation psychologists say. So how do we deal with that? And for me, that will look at asking, you know, how do we understand resistance to racism as an integral part of community mental health, as an integral part of healing? How does things like defunding the police, abolishing the police fit into that? How do things like um, redefining what community safety is? Because Black people are going to need to, you talk, the earlier presentation was talking about that, restorative justice, transformative justice. So approaches where Black people figure out how to protect themselves and also how to respond to the terror being meted out by the state. And then, uh, yeah, and then of course, if we're going to avoid criminalization and quote unquote criminality, the underlying needs, people's inability to survive will have to be addressed, right? So I'm going to leave it there. Thank you very much. So I'll start introducing myself so we can get right to it. So I'm Josephine Etoa. I'm a full professor here in the Faculty of Health Sciences at the University of Ottawa and hold a research chair in Black and women's HIV uh, care and prevention. I have been doing uh, research uh, on anti-racism for many, many years, more than uh, 20 years. Again, motivated by the lack of research on Black Canadians and always having to use research uh, from the states. My uh, textbook on anti-racist healthcare practice in 2009 was cited as the first of its kind in the Canadian literature to really get at racism in healthcare. And so it's something that I've been passionate about for uh, many years. But today, the focus is getting on 
uh, just talking about this uh, particular study and what we've done. So we work with uh, the Public Health Agency of Canada during the pandemic to create a national expert working group of Black Canadian leaders, academics, people, uh, community leaders coming together uh, to look at the pandemic impact across the country. And so we had a number of findings and I'm just going to take this few minutes to share just a little bit of it. I think before I go in, I still want to acknowledge uh, the, the land in which we stand. So in keeping with the indigenous protocol for building respectful relationships and grounding our own work as black Canadians and as active participants in the national reconciliation process, I'd like to acknowledge that I am, or we are currently situated in the ancestral land of the Algonquin people as immigrants, refugees, and the de descendants of those who have come here involuntarily, particularly as a result of the transatlantic slave trade. I am mindful of broken covenants and try to make this right with the land and with each other. We're here fighting to secure resources for black Canadians, but we will not do this at the expense of indigenous brothers and sisters or their communities. So I hope each of us is taking some time to acknowledge that land and that we're working in unison with our brothers and sisters in the indigenous community. Like I said, we have a number of leaders across the country that have come together to create this. I can't go naming them all. Shamara is the chief epidemiologist for the province of Prince Edward Island but also an adjunct professor with Dalhousie University. Charles is here at the University of Ottawa with me. You can see a whole list of us giving our limited time. I don't want to bore you with our team list. Um, again, I want to uh, put this disclaimer for all our presentation. The University of Ottawa does have a data sharing agreement with PHAC to always uh, have this statement, a disclaimer that this represents the views and opinions of the presenters and our expert working group, but may not reflect the views of the Public Health Agency of Canada and Health Canada. So uh, I'll just go quickly to the study. Why did we come up with this study? Actually, it's a study that I would say from the beginning comes out actually as a community-based research. During the pandemic, we partnered with uh, Public Health Agency of Canada again. Uh, this is the uh, sexually transmitted and infectious disease uh, department. And I led the project as a lead a PI from the University of Ottawa, working in partnership with our community partner, uh, Wangari Tairo at Women's Health in Women's Hands. And then we created the National Expert Working Group that represented leaders from each province in the country. Our goal was to collect data on how social determinants of health, such as mental health, uh, financial states, food security, housing stability, domestic violence, racism, stigma, discrimination, and substance use, all of these different aspects, how they were impacted during the uh, pandemic. And we do have a comprehensive a report that is online. PHAC has also published blogs on this part of the findings of our study. We've also created data visualization dashboard that you can go in because one of our goal is to make this data accessible to black leaders to use in the community to be able to advocate for changes. So if you go in, uh, you'll be able to see how you can play with different variables through the dashboard to create the results and the, the charts you can use in your own advocacy work. That is our, the National Expert Working Group, ACB New. And we like to use ACB because it helps, it reminds us of the diversity within our community. That when you're talking about community members who have or migrated from the African continent or from the Caribbean, so A for the those that have migrated from the continent, uh, C for those who have uh, descended from the Caribbean, 
and B, those are, that have been in Canada for multiple generations, every time we say it reminds us to always consider the diversity within the ACB communities. And so these are the uh, people in these different hubs and each hub was led by different group. And within that, we also had working groups that were led by different uh, members of the hub and leaders of each of these hubs. I'm going really quickly and can't even read the names of all our hub leads. Uh, uh, again, what we pride ourselves in doing with this particular study design is the way we work with peer around the country. It helps us to reach populations within the Black community that we haven't reached, especially in HIV testing that we've been doing. Um, we, there are some populations that we didn't reach because we asked the question here, and we saw significantly higher number of people that have not been tested. So we used a cross-sectional survey informed by the tenants of community-based participatory research. Uh, authentic policy and community academic partnership was enacted through multiple strategies, including the ACB new activities, uh, the collaboration with peer research associates. We train peers across the country, all have the same training. And then they were mobilizing in different. We had somebody in Nunavut, two people in Newfoundland, two uh, in PEI, and, and then we put it almost as a competition. In two months, we were able to recruit over 1,500 people. Uh, so it was just uh, the creative use of the peer research associates. They are members, of, they were all members of the community. And so they were trained to use, to work within the critical health and critical racial theory discourse. And data was collected again from May to June. We performed both the quantitative descriptive analysis and the multivariant uh, multinomial logistic regression that was uh, used to come up with some of uh, our analysis that you will see uh, again, very short because time is so short. This is, uh, how many people um, that we, we interviewed, 15, 56 ACB individuals across the country told us how they dealt with this. And they were quite diverse in terms of age, as you can see there, 11.4% uh, were under the age of 25 and we have 73% between 25 and 54 and 15.6% were above 55. Uh, in terms of our ethnic diversity, we had uh, 63% Black African, and uh, 28.3% Black Caribbean and Black Canadians. Those that have been here for multiple generations were about 7.3%. Gender, you can see here, the cisgender, 95, uh, 97% and 3%. And sexual orientation, we had 11.1% identified as LGBT. Q. What this did was help us to see where we need to put more effort in terms of recruitment, the communities we need to reach even more. So we're just zeroing in right down to mental health. Um, so most participants, we asked them a number of questions that targeted the mental health impact of the pandemic. So most participants reported that their mental health was excellent. You can see here 19.3% and very good, 27.9%. Uh, good was 26%. Only 6.1% people, a percent of the participants describe their mental health as poor. It's interesting, because then, um, so um, we asked them if they had changed in mental health since the start of the pandemic, and I, about, 41.5% of the participants reported that their mental health had not changed since the start of the pandemic. 25.4% of them reported an improvement in their mental health and only 33.1% reported that their mental health was somewhat worse or much worse. I'm looking at him now, Adam keeping time for me. Okay, okay thank you. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, so 41.9% uh, of the participants who assess, here we ask them, access to mental health and wellness, and 41.9% of participants who assess or consider assessing mental health um, actually had, con they considered 
this, are, this is the number that assessed it. And then the number that did not assess was higher. So out of that, those who considered assessing 61.7% did not always have access to, to the care. And 38.3 had access of those who assess it. And, and so we talk about barriers to assessing it. So, so many people did not have access. What was the problem? Difficulty getting appointment, costs associated uh, with going for these uh, services were considered some of the key problems here. Again, like I say, we, we actually have data visualization dashboard that you can go to. You can uh, assess it through my website at cocreate.ca. You can also assess it through uh, Simon Fraser University. Angela Kaida uh, was our lead for the data analysis team and led that particular analysis. So, what does this mean? We use this framework to interpret this. This is a Borden 2021 framework uh, for population mental health. And what it did was really help us to make those linkages between the risk factors and the, the needs of the community, the stressors, and also the interventions or supports that was available and linking all of that to mental health outcomes. It helps us to see how um, social determinants of mental health, like structural racism, actually creates or compounds the problem that people have in terms of the pandemic uh, stressors. They're dealing with uh, movement restriction, economic hardship, and racism on top of that just compounds the issue for them. It also helps us to see how we can design interventions that actually would address this issue. Um, that people are talking about and to measure them based on outcomes. So uh, you can see there that factors that were associated with improved mental health stage or unchanged mental health status was younger age, having less than his uh, high school education, receiving at least one pandemic related benefit, living in a home that became a uh, saver, uh, we had a number of questions to ask people whether they were able to assess any of the pandemic uh, benefits or resources that was available. Factors associated with worsened mental health status or unchanged wealth. Again, younger age, living in British Columbia, working, and that, those are some of the other analysis we're still doing, working uh, less, pandemic having a major impact on one's ability to pay bills, not applying or qualifying for pandemic. Uh, okay, I have one minute, okay. <laughs> now I know what it feels like. So what? <laughs> four, four key areas really quick. Uh, so uh, again, this is a big study and this is only a, a small piece of that. But may we, one of some of the recommendations uh, what is the implication for these mental health interventions that responds to the needs and barriers that ACB people face when assessing mental health is so important. Looking at evidence-informed programming that Black community members are involved in. The more data collection, especially around disaggregated uh, based on race and social determinants. And number three, we need ACB people to be involved in both the data collection and analysis. We need to build capacity for them to be in those rooms where discussions are had, questions are defined, and uh, even the, the methods are designed so that they can be part of the analysis and, and understand that. And I think that is one of the things we found. And, and number four is here, data management and governance. One of the things we would like to change about the process we just went through is having access to the data that we are part of the people even cleaning the raw data. Because what is clean is also influenced by who is sitting in the room and doing the data cleaning. And, and so we wanna be part of data management and governance uh, and, and work uh, to, to do that work. And we also think that we need to coordinate a strategy that helps ACB people to inform even the data that's being collected and to be part of the policies. Okay, time, so better stop. <laughs> Obey my own rules. Thank you. <laughs>
Thank you. <laughs> okay. <laughs> uh, how are we doing with time? We, we do have four minutes. <laughs> I, I thought it, it was 5.15. Okay. okay, so can the other speakers come up, please, in case people have questions, even if it's one or two, let's take two questions. Uh, can you join me, please? What is our first speaker? Oh, oh <laughs> okay, please. So, yes, please go ahead. You can give them the mic, please. And I can, and we can share this. Hi. Hi. Thank you for staying this late for us. No worries. Thank okay. you all for, for such amazing presentations. Like, all three of you were so informative, and I really appreciate um I really appreciate hearing from other professionals in, in the field. And I know that it takes a lot of a lot of oneself to be able to be an expert in this information and have access to this information and then disseminate it. So my question for all three of you is how do you take care of yourself as a black person? Four. Four? Four. I wasn't Four there for the fourth one. I'm so sorry. <laughs> it's for the third one. <laughs> Okay. Um, how do you how do you all take care of yourselves as um, you know black mental health professionals or researchers who have to you know engage with this really sometimes heavy information all the time, whether it be you having to talk about it with other white colleagues or non black colleagues who don't understand, or just having to be at the forefront and receiving the information. And you know, having people in the in your family that look like the people who are affected, or you yourself being affected, like how do you take care of yourself so that it's sustainable? Um, I haven't heard a lot you of. Want to start? <laughs> she <did as fast. laughs> uh, no, I mean, since I do community mental health and mental health and well-being, trauma-related stuff, uh, I try to apply everything I learn. So this year, that's looked like I have a very strong community of black mostly black women around me we've we've gone on retreats we do med you know we do what do you call it we go to spas we went did ayahuasca together <laughs> like so we do all kinds of things that are about nurturing our healing and for me the biggest part of that has been having a community which is why i'm very for me the only thing that works is having a community both to survive all of the violence but to work through it but also to build something so that's been key for me That's a really good question, actually. Um, I feel like it's more about um, a bit of self-care. And also, like she said, having like family around, uh, being connected with nature too. I do a lot of walks in nature. And so that helps, but uh, it's not easy. <laughs> I would say and be real. Sometimes it's a bit discouraging, but um, I think I have a lot of good people around me that helps me and uh, to vent also in different kind of situation and trying to paradise stuff that maybe I wouldn't do, like maybe station of yoga and meditation and I'm starting to, to apply. And my colleague who works with me, she's a yoga teacher. So I'm trying to, <laughs> and she's more Zen than me. And so I'm trying to get um, a lot of her practice, but it's, it's a process. Well, I've covered all my points. <laughs> I'm not very good at it. As a researcher, not only that you're dealing with this, uh, you deal with all of the other pieces that goes with doing research and constantly fighting to do research in different ways that meaningfully engages the people that you're talking about. Uh, it wasn't easy 12 years ago, even applying to ethics at the University of Ottawa and being called to face the whole ethics committee. Why are you doing this research this way? Why are you, but it's, uh, it's working. Uh, we're, we're pushing the boundaries and we see change, yeah. Yes. <laughs> and for me, it's my family. I have three black boys, three black men. Um, so they're my inspiration. And so I guess for me, taking care of me means taking care of them and making sure that they're safe. And so two of them are at the university that I'm at, but I still have to have the talk every day. And I also surround myself with sisters, um, which is really healthy. And I'm a walker. And when I was younger, you know, like university, I played soccer. So I still do a little bit of physical stuff to keep me going. But 
yeah, and making sure we come to these things, right? Because these validate how we're feeling and what we're experiencing. So validation is important to me from my brothers and sisters. So I'm glad for this opportunity. Yeah. Uh, Dr. So I one. I, I garden a lot. That's one way I can, yeah. yes. <laughs> Spend time in the garden, yeah. And read some books that are not academic books. <laughs> 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 Dr. Otoa, this question is for you over okay. here, Suzanne. Yes, hi, Suzanne. Nice having lunch with you today. Um, my question is really about the data and the impact of COVID-19. As we know, our families in the Black community are multi-generational families. And I'm just wondering if the data collected is the impact on those multi-generational households where there's granny and granddad and, you know, aunties and uncles who are in the home who can also be medically fragile. So I'm just wondering if the data collected that as well. Yes, we did ask people how many people in their household. And so those are some of the variables we're still analyzing. Yes. Yeah. Thank you. I said two questions, I guess. Thank you. Oh, but I have the mic. <laughs> um, first of all, thank you very, all, all of you very much for your presentations, especially the, the ones related to policing. So I, I wanted to, I guess, share a story and then ask a question. So um, I'm a federal government employee and, and was in the federal government for like since 1999. And I've also lived with depression for a lot of that time. So for most of my time in the, in the federal, in the government, I was a depressed and um, obedient Negro. But then in December 2017, me and another guy launched the Federal Black Employees Caucus and started um, challenging systemic anti-Black racism in the federal government. So my story is about how this stuff cuts across class and it's very much about maintaining privilege. So after I did that, my bosses started hitting, hitting me with one sanction after another, culminating with them uh, banning me from all my departmental buildings and circulating a poster to security guards that said, um, Robin is banned from all departmental buildings. If he shows up, ask him politely for his pass. If he refuses, call security. And don't hesitate to call 911 if he shows signs of violence. Okay, so I got that through access to information. The story ends up happy, I'm now, but anyway, so they, but what I want to ask is, so actually it's, as, as a result of that, I'm now a full-time, uh, paid black activists, paid by your federal tax dollars, my sisters. So that's all good. But and our group started off as being reformist in terms of the police. Now we're abolitionists, and we have not been getting a lot of love from the black community. So that's the question. I want to like. There's a. I, I don't know if there's any data around what's look the, the support for abolition or even defunding among black folks. But I'd like. I really would like to get that data because we've been getting getting a lot of hate with our position. So. If I just want to quickly answer that, like, sorry for, for first of all, for what you experienced with the federal government and yeah. What's your organization? Okay. And congratulations on doing that work. My quick answer to that is that um, when I've heard people talk about abolition, so defunding is like redistributing resources to community organizations so that the structural issues can be addressed instead of just policing people. But abolition as going towards removing the existence of police. I think the, the reason people have hesitation around that is because people aren't equally discussing then what are you going to do to ensure safety for communities to address violence, to do the things the police are purportedly there to do. So I think once you start creating those things or talking about how we do those things, I think people could be okay with, okay, you have how you're gonna deal with violence? Great, we can get rid of the police. Oh, oh it's just a quick question. 
it's just a quick one. It's just a quick one. Uh, again, as everyone said, thank you all so much for your presentations. Um, I was especially moved by the video of individuals with lived experience, and that's a little piece of uh, inspiration I'm going to take into my own PhD research. I just had a quick question for Dr. Otoa. Um, one of the factors that you discussed was pandemic-related benefits. I was wondering if you could expand on that. Um, I know from my own experience with my family, losing my grandfather to COVID, um, there weren't benefits. So I'm just wondering what those were. I'm sorry for your loss. Yes, you will notice after I, even when I said it, I thought would people see some of the resources that were giving us benefits when they're really benefits. Um, so I think we will change our language. I noticed even after I said it, the first sentence, the second sentence, I said resources. Uh, some of the resources that was provided for people who lost their jobs, that's what we were trying to capture in the data. Uh, it was recording if, if you were able to stop, stop work because you can't walk in the front line. Did you get any of those resources that the government provided? Yeah, that's what we were capturing. And it did not replace the loss that people had uh, in the community, not at all. Yeah. Thank you. Yes. Okay, so thank you, everyone.